Hey everyone, my name is Melissa Tyson and I'm a counselor. I've been counseling for 14 years and I work primarily with teenagers. I love working with teens. Currently I work at Meadows of Hope, which is a residential treatment home for teen girls who are struggling with life dominating issues. They live there for a year and a half to two years. They go to school there and I provide the counseling services there. And I also work at Upward Call Counseling Services, which is an outpatient Christian counseling Center, and there I work with teens as well as adults. So I'm so glad people are talking about this because it used to be that people dealt with it, it's always been around, but they dealt with it, put on a fake smile, and then went home and struggled silently. And so I'm so grateful that society is changing a little bit, there's a lot more to go, but it's changing and churches are changing, just like this one who's brave enough to talk about these things. So you are so blessed to be able to receive um, teaching on this issue from a church like this who's brave enough to confront it. All right, so let's dive in. I'm excited to do that and excited for you to know more so you can live educated and wise. So I wanna to talk to you first about what depression and anxiety are and what they are not because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about this issue. So here's the deal. If you are human, and I assume all of you are, you will have anxiety, you will have depression. It's part of life. So let's say you have a final exam coming up and you have some nerv nervousness about that. It feels anxious to you. Um, you may feel some physical symptoms, maybe in your stomach and your heart. That's normal. That's part of being human. Let's say you play football and your football team made the playoffs and you have a little nervousness about that normal. Let's say someone you loved dies. Let's say your grandma or grandpa dies. Let's say a beloved pet in your family dies and you feel really sad for a couple days. That's normal. Um, so I want to give an example. I have a nephew who's 14 and his girlfriend broke up with him recently and so the day that that happened, he spent the day in his bedroom. My sister, his mom, heard him crying. And then at the end of the day, he came out and he wanted to talk a little bit about it. And he said, Mom, I, I think it's okay. I think I can move on from this. But he just needed the day to grieve over that. That is not depression, at least clinically. We could call it, you know, he was depressed that day. But it's different than clinical depression. And that's what I want to teach you about today. I'm going to tell you about what would be defined as clinically significant where you'd receive a mental health diagnosis. Let's focus on depression first. So the actual clinical term for it is called major depressive disorder. Major depressive disorder. And if you receive that diagnosis, it would be from someone like myself who's a counselor or maybe your family doctor. Or if you go to a psychiatrist, a psychiatrist is a person who's a medical doctor that specializes in psychiatric medicines. So any of those people can give you this clinical diagnosis of major depressive disorder. And when they do, they specify whether it's mild, moderate, or severe. If it is severe, you're definitely going to need help. If it's moderate, you probably do. If it's mild, you might be able to do some home remedies, but it varies case to case. All right, so let's talk about what this is. I'm going to give you the clinical diagnostic criteria that any professional, whether they're a mental health professional like myself or a medical professional, would use to determine whether you have major depressive disorder or not. So a person must have five or more of the following symptoms that I'm going to read to you, including at least one of the first two nearly every day for at least two weeks. Now that's really important. So if you have a bad day or even a bad week, that doesn't count clinically. The first one is an unusually sad mood. So you might cry a lot. You might just feel not like yourself. Maybe you're a normally laughy person and you don't even laugh anymore. Maybe um, a person that makes you laugh or a show that makes you laugh, it doesn't anymore. So a mood that's unusually sad, that's the first one. The second one is a loss of enjoyment in previously enjoyed activities. So let's say you dance. Let's say you love taking ballet lessons or hip hop or jazz and you just don't want to go to your lessons anymore. Let's say you love playing soccer and you like playing your yard a lot and you don't want to do that anymore. Let's say you like painting, you like shopping, you like crafting, you like video gaming. Any of those things you enjoy, you don't want to do anymore. That's number two. 
Number three is a lack of energy and tiredness. And I'm not talking about you stayed up too late and you have to get up for school at six o'clock. <laughs> that's different, that's normal. What I'm saying is you feel way more tired than normal and it's not because you're not sleeping enough or because maybe you're more active than normal. The next one is feeling worthless or unnecessarily guilty. Now, I think there's times where all of us maybe just don't feel good about ourselves. You probably heard the term low self-esteem. That's a common term in our culture. It's not just an occasional bout of that. It's feeling a deep heaviness that I am worse than everybody else. Maybe people around me would be better if I weren't here. Maybe it's God is furious with me and there's no redemption from that. Just a deep, overwhelming sense of worthlessness or a guilt that shouldn't be there. The next one, and this one's pretty serious, is thoughts about death. So I talk to people a lot of times who tell me life feels so hopeless and overwhelming that they don't want to live anymore. That's a serious symptom and it is a common one with depression. So definitely, if that is something that you've ever thought of, which is not uncommon, uh, please tell someone about it. I'll talk more about that later. Next one, difficulty concentrating. So let's say a class that you normally love at school, like let's say you really like math class and you just cannot concentrate, or you really like um, a certain activity at home and you can't concentrate on it, or even conversations you can't concentrate. That could be a sign. Moving more slowly or become becoming agitated. So usually with depression, we see extremes. We see either or. Either you're feeling really sluggish in your body and movements or you're feeling keyed up and restless. And same with the next symptom, which is sleeping too much or too little. Either the person wants to sleep all the time or maybe they can't fall asleep or they can't stay asleep. Sometimes they might have nightmares. Then the next symptom, same thing, eating too much or too little. So maybe you have this huge appetite and you want to eat to comfort yourself, or you don't feel like eating at all, even some foods that you normally really enjoy. That could be a sign of depression. So what I just read to you, to recap, you need to have five of those symptoms nearly every day for two weeks. And you need to have at least one of the first two symptoms. That would give you a clinical diagnosis of major depressive disorder. All right, let's keep going. Let's talk about anxiety. Now anxiety, like I said before, is a normal human experience, but there's a difference between normal human anxiety and a clinical diagnosis. So there's a bunch of different clinical anxiety disorders but the one I want to focus on today for our purposes is Generalized Anxiety Disorder. GAD would be the acronym for that to shorten it. Generalized Anxiety Disorder. So I'm going to tell you the diagnostic criteria for that so you understand what it is. All right. So this is defined as excessive anxiety and worry occurring more often than not for at least six months. So if you remember, depression was only two weeks. It was a lot shorter. But for anxiety to be diagnosed, it has to be six months. Also, the anxiety is difficult to control. It causes significant distress and it impairs daily functioning. So it's hard to just deal with daily life. At least three of the symptoms that I'm about to read to you must accompany the anxiety. Although if you're a child, it only takes one. All right, so here's those symptoms. The first one is restlessness or feeling on edge. You feel like you're not peaceful, you're not calm, you can't just relax. You always feel like unsettled inside, maybe even physically shaky with that. The second symptom is being easily fatigued. That's a way of saying you're super tired all the time. You just don't have energy. And as teenagers, y'all should have energy. Like you should be in the prime of your lives energy wise. So if you're feeling like you just don't have it, pay attention to that, especially if it's a change from how you normally are. The next one is difficulty concentrating. So your brain may be all over the place. Often it's all over the place with worries, with fears, with things that you're dreading, with thoughts that are dark and foreboding and difficult. If those kind of thoughts are keeping you from concentrating on what you need to do, whether it's school or sports or drama or clubs, whatever you're doing, then pay attention to that. 
The next one is irritability. It means you're grouchy. Um, people are annoying you more often than they normally do or more intensely than they normally do. That's irritability. Muscle tension. So often if a person has anxiety, they'll clench their muscles and they don't even realize it, especially right here and right here, people carry a lot of tension there. So sometimes you feel even physically um, tensed up. It's like you can't just relax and chill. Your body is carrying that anxiety in it. And the next one is sleep disturbance. If a person's anxious, they often have trouble falling asleep because they can't shut their brain off. They're just thinking about thoughts that are disturbing to them. Those are the symptoms that a person would need to meet to receive a diagnosis of generalized anxiety disorder. And again, the person that would give that to you would be your medical doctor, a counselor, a psychologist who is a doctoral level counselor, and they can do psychological testing, as well as a psychiatrist, which I explained to you before. All right, so those are the diagnostic criteria, and as I said before, you can be mild, moderate, or severe with depression and anxiety. Sometimes depression and anxiety occur together, and when they do, we call that comorbid. It means they're occurring together. So if you ever hear, hear that term comorbid, if you take psychology class in high school or maybe in college, um, you can thank me because I'm getting you ahead. Let's talk about physical symptoms. Anxiety, depression, they don't just affect our thoughts and our emotions, they affect our physical bodies. And I wanna share with you those physical symptoms that can happen. And if they are, they're not all in a person's head. They're not just imagining them, they are truly happening. All right, so the list I'm about to share with you can occur with depression and anxiety both. So headaches, um, with that, it can be head pain. It could turn into a migraine where it's hard to look at lights. It's hard to hear noises. Uh, muscle aches and pains, which I talked about earlier. Stomach aches. I always say to people, heads, hearts, and stomachs are very frequently affected. So if you have stomach pain, if your stomach is digesting violently, if you're having nausea, that could be a depressive or anxious symptom. I'll just, let's be frank, okay? Constipation, diarrhea, that can go with it too. Because our heads, our hearts, our bodies, they're all connected. God intended them to work that way. So when one of them is not doing well, the other will be affected. So definitely our digestive systems are gonna be affected by that. Now I wanna talk about anxiety specifically because its symptoms can be a little different than depression. So anxiety, let's focus on that, isolated, can come with its shakiness. So maybe you can be physically shaking. I've had clients in my office where I'm watching them just shake in front of me. Um, your hearts are often affected, as I said before, so your heart could be racing, it could be pounding, it could be hurting. Sometimes Anxiety can mimic a heart attack, so I've actually had clients go to the ER thinking that they're dying, but it's anxiety produced. So the heart can hurt, it can race, it can pound. The next one is shortness of breath. So your lungs can feel like they're being smothered, it can feel like you're not getting enough air in if you're really anxious, or it can feel like you're breathing very quick and very shallowly. Another one is dizziness. I've had clients say to me they feel like they're going to faint, like the room is spinning, like things are feeling fuzzy and blurry. That can come over a person if they're anxious. Or sweating, especially the palms. You can feel like your palms are sweating, just that nervous feeling. So to compare and contrast them, think of it as depression is slowing down and anxiety is speeding up. So often with depression, we feel tired, we feel more sluggish. Sometimes a really depressed person, even their speech is slower. With anxiety, it's like everything is fast and tense and nervous. Hope that makes sense to you. All right, let's keep going. So I talked before in the diagnostic criteria about how the symptoms interfere with daily functioning. Let's talk about what that means a little more, and I wanna give you a way to remember that. I wanna teach you the five L's. So these are five words, all that start with the letter L, that can help you remember how to identify when your functioning is shutting down. So if you ever have significant increased problems in any of these areas that the five L's cover, pay attention because it may be, maybe, an indication of anxiety or depression. All right, so the first L 
is live. If you have trouble just living, just getting out of bed in the morning, grooming, a lot of times when I work with a client who's depressed, they stop showering, maybe they smell bad, maybe they don't care about dressing nice anymore. They might stop wearing makeup if normally they like to. They might stop fixing their hair. They might just look a wreck and smell a wreck. So often hygiene and grooming go downhill. Also with living, eating, sleeping, all those activities of daily living, when they go downhill, that's the L for live. That could be an indication that there's a problem. So the first L out of the five is live. The second one is love. If you have trouble with your relationships where normally they're good, if you don't feel like seeing your friends anymore, if you wanna isolate yourself in your room, you don't wanna see your family, um, if the love that you have in your life for people around you, if that's being affected, pay attention to that. It may be anxiety or depression. So the first L is live, the second is love, the third is laugh. So if you don't smile anymore, if you don't laugh anymore, if things that you normally enjoy don't make you happy anymore, pay attention to that. That may be an indication. So live, love, laugh, the fourth is learn. So if you guys are the age that you're in middle school, high school, obviously Pennsylvania law says you gotta go to school. So you are learning right now, you are scholars. If you feel like normally school goes well for you and all of a sudden your grades start slipping, you can't concentrate in class, you're not turning your homework in and it's not for another outside reason, pay attention to that. I've had students who are clients of mine that are top-notch students, they're um, honorable students, and all of a sudden they might start failing a class and it's because depression's creeping in. Something to pay attention to. And the five L is labor, meaning work. Let's say you have a job at Chick-fil-A and you normally like going, because come on, it's Chick-fil-A, and you don't want to go anymore. And it's not just because you don't feel like working, it's just because you want to hole up in your room and isolate. If your ability to do chores, let's be honest, most teens don't like chores, but let's say that you just have this extra sluggish tiredness and you just feel like you can't do it. That's different. So those are the five L's. Those are something to pay attention to if there's a decrease in functioning in any of those areas where there wasn't a problem before, just something to pay attention to. It doesn't mean, oh, I don't feel like doing the dishes, I'm depressed. It doesn't mean that, so don't tell your mom and dad that I said that, because I didn't. What I did say is if it's different from how it normally is. You get me. All right, so let's talk about who gets depressed and anxious. Statistics tell us about one in five teens will have depression. And girls, we do tend to see it a little more in girls. So girls tend to have it two to three times higher than boys do. Now with anxiety, the stats are a little different. It's one in four teens will have anxiety. So the risk factors for anxiety and depression here they are, being female, because like I said, girls have a little higher rate, having a more sensitive emotional nature. There's some of us that just feel deeply, think deeply, and that is a blessing and a gift. We need those people in the world, but sometimes people with that personality type do tend to take on heavy feelings a little more, so they may be more prone to anxiety or depression. Another risk factor is having a family history of mental health problems. So for example, if you have a mom or a dad or a brother or a sister who has anxiety or depression, your chances may be a little elevated. That doesn't mean you're gonna get it for sure, it just means your risk is a little higher. Another risk factor is parental separation or divorce. Now that doesn't mean if your parents are divorced or separated, you're definitely getting anxiety or depression. It doesn't mean that at all. Again, it's just your risk is a little higher. Um, coming from a family that has a lower socioeconomic status, and what that means is poorer. So families that live in poverty do have a higher risk of having anxiety or depression. If your parent has an alcohol problem or a drug problem, kids with parents like that, and I've worked with some of them in my counseling practice, are gonna struggle a little more with anxiety and depression. Then certain medical conditions, for example, Lyme's disease, if you've ever heard of that, where you get bit by a tick and they carry the disease, uh, one of the symptoms of that is depression. So I've had different clients with Lyme's who are struggling with depression as a side effect. If you have cancer, um, there, yeah, there's a variety of them where if you have that, then your body is fighting so hard and often it does affect the emotions. So in my 
experience of 14 years working as a counselor, my opinion is that the number one factor why kids, teens, and adults have depression and anxiety is abuse. So childhood abuse, whether it's physical, sexual, emotional, or neglect, where a kid's not being properly fed or clothed or protected, are huge factors of why people struggle with these issues. If this describes you in your home, please, please reach out for help because you can't do this alone and you shouldn't have to do it alone. And things can get better, but they typically don't without some intervention. So um, that's a subject for another day and another seminar, but please, please reach out if that is you. All right, so I wanna talk about how can this get better because it can. Depression, anxiety, they're treatable things. That doesn't mean that some people don't struggle with them long term because some people do. But for many people, and I've worked with so many of them, they struggle with it for a season and then it can get better. So here is how they get better. I call this the whole person approach. So like I was saying earlier, everything's connected. Our minds, our emotions, our physical bodies, and our spirit, all of this is connected. So if we treat it all, if we tend to it all, then it can all get better together. So the whole person approach that I'm gonna to talk to you about involves six components. And the first one is physical. So that means taking care of your physical body, getting enough sleep at night. And I know teens often are notorious for not doing that. Like get yourself to bed at a decent hour, get enough sleep. If you need to take a nap on a Saturday, Sunday afternoon, so be it, just get sleep. The second one is diet. Adequate nutrition does affect our emotions. If you're eating Pop-Tarts all day, like honestly, <laughs> you're probably not gonna function super well. And I'm not saying you can't ever have like treat food. Come on now, cake is good. Fast food is good. Pizza, can we talk about pizza? But it's all moderation. Like you need green stuff, you just do. You need fruits, you need vegetables, you need whole grains, all that. So good nutrition. And then exercise. There's a lot of research showing that Exercise can help our brains similarly to the way an antidepressant medication does. So we have chemicals in our brains that are responsible for our emotional states. And when you exercise, they'll be firing through your brain and they'll help elevate your mood. So exercise is so, so good for us, not just our bodies, but also our emotions. So the first piece to the whole po person approach is physical. The second one is spiritual. So I love this. Research shows, even secular research, that having a religious faith makes people happier on a whole. So even the fact that you're coming to church here is such a good step for your mental health. And this is an awesome church, getting connected here, reaching out to your youth pastors and youth volunteers, connecting with each other at church is such a good step for your mental health. Prayer, Bible reading, worship, connecting with the Lord. These things are so, so good for our mental health. So do it. I'm all about it. Not just because faith is important and it's good and it works, but because it has benefits. All right. So we got physical, we got spiritual, then relational. So we need people in our lives. We weren't meant to live alone. God meant us to connect to each other in relationship. So if you are feeling lonely, if you feel like you don't have enough friends, I encourage you get more involved in this church or get involved in a sport, an art, a club. Just get yourself out there. And I know it takes courage to do so, but when you do, you can connect with people and people are what we desperately need, especially when we're struggling. Even our families, connect to our families, our pets. Pets can be a huge source of relationship for us. So get connected with relationships. That's the third. The fourth is emotional and mental. So read books about what you're struggling with. If you're depressed, get books on that. If you're anxious, go to websites about it. If you need counseling, do it. There is shame in it for a lot of people, but there doesn't need to be. Truly, people that come to counseling, they come because they're human. If you're human, you struggle, and it's truly a humble person that's okay to admit that. So if you need to go, go, and do so for yourself, for your families, and for everyone you love, but most of all, do it for you. Number five is biochemical. What that big word means is like I was saying earlier, we got chemicals in our brains. Sometimes they're a little off, whether that is an inherited condition. Science doesn't always know why, honestly. But if they are a little off, 
Sometimes people take what's called an antidepressant medication. Um, sometimes the nickname for that is SSRI. And if you take one of those, oh well, lots of people do. I have many clients that need it just for a short time. Maybe they take it just for a year. Some people are on it longer term, but either way, it's okay. Some people don't need it at all and they can get through their anxiety and depression without it and others do. Either way, it's okay. No shame in it. And the last one is situational. Can your situation be changed? For example, I've worked with some kids who maybe they're going to a school where they're getting bullied and their parents take the step to cyber school them or change them to a different school. So sometimes we need to be tough and face our situations, but if they're overwhelming us to the point where we're shutting down, can you change your situation? Sometimes we can't, but sometimes we can. Are you dating someone that's treating you like crap? Well, maybe you need to end the relationship. If you're in, you know, there's all kinds of life situations. You can think of your own. If you're in one that's really distressing you and you've prayed about it and your parents feel like it's a good idea to get out of it, then okay. Like I said, sometimes we face things, but sometimes it's okay to bow out. All right. So those are some treatment options talking about the whole person approach. The last thing I want to talk to you about is coping skills. So the word cope basically means to deal. How do we deal with life when it's tough? How do we deal with people and situations when they're tough? How do we deal with thoughts and emotions when they're tough? Well, a coping skill is anything that helps alleviate difficult, negative, emotional states. So it could be something simple. I have a lot of clients who love running. I don't get it, I hate running. But some people love running, they think it's awesome. So if you love running, do it. There's some people that they love drawing. Maybe they love singing. Maybe they love playing guitar. Some people love um, cake decorating. Some people love soccer. Some people love gaming. Some people like coding. Whatever it is that you like, do that. That's actually a coping skill. Other types of coping skills. Journaling. Counselors love journaling. Processing what's going on in your heart, head, life, relationships. Such a good thing to do. Other coping skills can be things like taking your thoughts captive, which is actually a biblical principle. Like if you're thinking negative thoughts all day long, take inventory of them and ask yourself, is it really true? For example, if a person has a thought, everybody hates me, think about that. Do they really? Like even if some people do, which hello, all of us are going to be hated once in a while. Are there people that love you? I'm sure there are. You have to think of these things. So you have to speak truth to yourself. Truth sets us free, the Bible says that. There's so many others that I don't have the time to go into, but when I work with a client, we always talk about coping skills because it's something we all need to employ in our lives. So what you need to ask yourself is, if I'm struggling, am I using a positive or a negative coping skill? So the ones I just talked about were positive. There's also negative ones. For example, you could go get drunk out of your mind. That is a coping skill. Is it a bad one? Yeah. But will it make you forget your problems for a while? Sure. But in the end, it's not positive. I have some people that have promiscuous sex, like they'll just go meet someone, they don't even know their name, and then they'll just go have sex with them because life is really hard and they want to forget about it. I have some people that spend way too much money because it makes them feel better for a while, even though later they're super guilty and super in debt. There's so many things a person can do to cope negatively. Um, for some of you, maybe it's being mean. Like I work with a lot of teens that when they're struggling, what they do is try to step on someone else. They try to hurt someone to inflict pain on someone else so they can forget how miserable they are or just spread the misery. So those are all examples of negative coping skills. So what my hope is for all of you is that when you're struggling, my number one hope is turn to the Lord. He loves you. He does. And he is bigger, I promise you, than anything you're going through. I don't care if it's abuse, neglect, rejection, bullying, if you're struggling with your identity, with your sexual orientation, if you are having a horrible time at school, if you have physical disabilities, if you have learning disabilities, the list could go on and on and on. No matter what it is, I promise you God is bigger. He is. And that doesn't mean that fixes are quick or instant, but he's good and he loves you and he's there. So if you are struggling today, please don't do this alone. There are people at this church who I promise you want to help you. 
you have someone in your life, maybe it's in your family, I hope it's in your family, but I know all families aren't like that. So if, if it's not in your family, maybe it's a teacher, maybe it's a mentor, maybe it's an extended family member, maybe it's a neighbor, but reach out. Don't struggle alone because you don't have to. And often when we humble ourselves and we admit that we need help, that's when we find it. And that's when God can work through his people. So blessings to all of you. I'm so glad you were here today. I hope you got something from this. And if there's nothing more I can leave you with, let it be this. God loves you and he's bigger than your struggles. Thanks for letting me address you today.